All right, it is five o'clock. I think we're ready. We have the honor of having Dr. Richard M. Cash with us tonight, who is an award-winning educator and author who worked in the field of education for over 30 years. He has taught, uh, coordinated curriculum, done program administration, and now he is a well-recognized educational consultant. And I think that you're gonna love tonight because his title is Helping Students Learn in the New World, Self-Regulation Strategies for E-Learning. We know that there are students who are gonna do well in this new form of schooling, and we know that there are a lot of students who are gonna struggle. So he's gonna help us uh, think through that and how to get through this fall that's coming up in this uh, new way that we're doing education. So please help me welcome Dr. Richard Cash. Hello, everyone out there in Colorado land, um, one of my favorite spots in the country. So uh, it's very nice to virtually be here. And Elizabeth, thank you for introducing me. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here and pop that up. And okay, I gotta, sorry, I gotta, this is, okay, here, here's the thing. Everybody is new to this, no matter, no matter how much we've been online, how often we've got kids that uh, think that they are, you know, what, what are called native to technology. Everybody's new to this. This literally changed overnight for me on Friday, March 13th. Uh, I never knew a Friday the 13th could be that awful. Um, that was the last trip, uh, last flight I took. Um, I was doing some work for the West Virginia Department of Education, and I was supposed to be there till the 20th of March. And on Friday night, I was supposed to stay overnight in Charleston, uh, or over the weekend in Charleston, and um, the governor shut the state down. And I panicked, thinking, oh my gosh, they're going to totally shut the whole, you know, country down, because I was hearing all kinds of bad rumors about stuff. So um, I quick uh, got a one-way ticket from Pittsburgh, because that was the closest airport, to Palm Springs, because I live in Palm Springs during the, the winter months, live in Minneapolis during the summer months. So right now it's a beautiful evening in Minneapolis. Um, I haven't been in a plane since, and that is very rare for me. I don't think I have not traveled for this long in over seven years. Uh, so it's been a learning situation for me too. Um, uh, we all, everyone, adults and children, are going through the same emotional roller coaster right now. Uh, we are all frustrated. We are all anxious. We are all angry. We are all depressed. Uh, one of the things that I've learned very well from a good friend of mine, uh, Scott Barry Kaufman, is that it, rather than avoid the feeling, lean into it, lean into it, and try to make friends with it because it's not going to go away. And I think it's how we deal with that. And you're going to see in this presentation here how you deal with it in the multiplicity of ways of dealing with it is what is going to make us come out of this uh, better people. Um, so not only is this presentation um, something that can apply to your children, it also may apply to you too and people around you. Um, this comes from the work uh, from in my book, which is called Self-Regulation in the Classroom, Helping Students Learn How to Learn. Well, the unfortunateness is that this book was written well before we knew all about this virtual learning stuff. And, and I have to be honest and upfront of, with you. I, I'm doing a lot of webinars. I'm doing a lot of this, this virtual stuff. Um, and I can tell you that I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't think um, people are learning. The adults are learning as much as when I'm face on with them. And I also know for a fact that kids are not learning as much through this venue. However, we can't stop. We can't just put life on pause until there is a vaccine or until there's this herd mentality or herd uh, immunization or what do they call it, herd, herd something. Uh, and, and we can't wait, we've gotta keep going. So we do the best that we can. And I want you to be sure as parents out there and as a teacher, 
the teachers didn't create this and the teachers are only reacting as quickly as they know how possible they are doing everything in their power now i come from a family of teachers all of my siblings are teachers uh, i have cousins that are teachers i have for all my friends are teachers so they are working they have all been working through their summer they've all been working 10 12 hour days uh, when it was virtual learning this is not their fault when things go awry please 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 as adults we have to keep in mind the teachers are working their very hardest to do what's right for our kids so keep that in mind as you get frustrated that the teachers are are 30 times that frustrated so for every child they have they feel and i'll tell you from experience i felt like my students were my children i had that personal investment in them i was lucky i taught middle school for a very short period of time that was the lucky part <laughs> because anybody that's got a middle schooler knows that that's kind of a quirky type of life um, but then i moved down to first grade and i taught first grade for the vast majority of my teaching uh experience and um i cried every year when my kids left my classroom at the on the last day of school except for one year and i called that crop failure um because it was just that that one year is like oh i couldn't wait till these kids get out the door what i do know happened in uh the especially in minnesota um teachers didn't see their kids since about the end of february beginning of march and they didn't get that closure with them and they didn't get to to congratulate them on moving upwards um not just our seniors but even a second grader loves to know that now i'm in third grade and a first grader knows now i'm going on to second grade a kindergartner knows now i'm going to real school um so this is it was a it's a an emotionally difficult time for everyone um and there are ways that we can value from this and find those silver linings and then ultimately grow and learn from this so what i have found in my experience is that the the students that have the most frustration in the learning process are those who don't know how to regulate themselves throughout the learning process. So what I have been doing probably now for about the last 15, 20 years, I've been studying this idea of what is called self-regulation. Now, some of you may have heard about SEL, social and emotional learning. Well, let me tell you, that's only a two-legged stool. Um, it, it, social and emotional learning really comes out of the studies on self-regulation. Self-regulation is a more well-grounded concept of this and it it is a tri-dimensional idea so we have these three dimensions equal dimensions they're equally important now one is better than the other one is attached to all the others so we have to understand that they are interrelated they're intertwined one of the dimensions is what is called our affect dimension and now affect are our feelings they're different. Now, this is the E in SEL, emotion. Emotion, however, is a chemical reaction that happens in your brain. This, I know this is technical and it's word splicing, but um, emotion really is the chemical reaction that happens within your brain in the amygdala that is biological. It happens to us. We don't control it. It controls us. How we react to that or respond to that, what are called emotional responses, are called our feelings. And our feelings are those which are actually up here in our prefrontal cortex that we can then articulate. Now we learn those affects, those feelings, from the people who are around, from our parents, from our cultures, from our groups that we're invested in, and so forth because we see how others react when things emo happen emotionally and they and kids copy that and they it's modeled for them and it they copy it so how we as adults around our children respond to anxiety respond to our own stresses respond to joyful experiences 
that's how kids are going to ultimately do because that that is what happens is that we see it and it kind of registers in our head that that's how I need to respond in these situations. Now, there are lots of techniques that we can use to help um, take a hold of and manage our feelings. Um, you know, my mom always used to say, when you get mad, you stop, take a deep breath, and count to 10. Okay, now, my mom wasn't a neuroscientist. She was a good mom who knew the old adage that don't let the emotion take over. And the emotion is a chemical reaction. So when someone did something that angered me, my amygdala shot out all kinds of chemicals that rushed my system, like adrenaline and so forth, rushes my system. You want to instantly respond to that because that's a kind of a biological, um, natural effect within our brain to want to respond to that. So when she said, take a deep breath, well, what the deep breath actually does is it floods your brain with oxygen rich blood, which calms that down, which calms that those uh, chemicals down in both your brain and the rest of your body. Counting to 10 gives it that moment to start thinking rationally, which is up here in the prefrontal cortex. Now, I'm sure none of you have done this, but if you've heard of the thing called road rage, well, that's what road rage is. It's, it's that unnatural downshifting and going into an unreasoned response to something that is pretty minimal. Mike, I called it hallway rage when I was with kids uh, because what they would do is say, he got in front of me, you know? And it's like, yeah, okay, Tommy's gonna get there a nanosecond before you do. How illogical is that response, right? But I know my first graders, they were five, six years old, so they are not, they are not at an emotional regulation stage that they can manage it, so I did the same thing. I said, stop, take a deep breath, to 10. And it, with younger students, it, it is very hard to reason with them. So if you've got younger students prior to, well, even middle schools are hard to re reason with too, but um, reasoning is up here in the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex is not fully developed until about anywhere between 24 and 28 years old. So to do a good job of reasoning, it has to be developed. The prefrontal cortex really is just beginning its development. It has its biggest developmental stage during adolescence. And this is why adolescents do crazy, crazy things is because that part of their brain is like scrambled eggs at that point. This is why you can't reason with a two-year-old. This is why they go into temper tantrums. Temper tantrums are basically something is happening chemically in their brain and they throw the tantrum because they're trying to get a response. They're trying to practice that particular response that's been given before that got attention. So if I cried, I got a bottle. Now if I cry, I'm gonna get my way. Okay, so it just gets a little more sophisticated. So they're crying because they're trying to practice these affects. How do I, how do, I do that? So um, you can't reason with young children because they're, they don't have that capacity yet but you can offer them choices. And with little, the littles, I suggest that you give them one or two choices, or you give them two choices, not one, but give them two choices and, and, and viable choices for them. Older kids, no more than three, uh, to help them take charge of their affect. So what we do know also is how you feel about a learning situation is, where you will put your attention, where you will focus your attention. So in the learning on virtual, a lot of kids don't feel good this way. And several of the questions that I got were about extroverts. Um, surprise, surprise, I'm an extrovert. I hate this platform. I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. I have to get my extroverted energy from other places. I cannot expect to get it from this platform. Now, what for parents that have extroverted students, and I got a couple questions, like I said, on that. 
for them, you're going to have to find different venues for your child to get your energies, get their energies from uh, in whatever ways they can be interactive with it. Maybe it might be you set up virtual, um, well, as adults, we set up virtual happy hours, but maybe you could set up virtual play times with your, with your kid where they can at least have their friends, not a school situation, but where their friends are, where they can have those communications. If you've got um, siblings in the family, that's how they're gonna generate their energies is interacting with them. Um, though I grew up in a, a family of five and sometimes I didn't wanna play with my siblings because I'd had enough of them throughout the day. So finding those venues for kids to be able to interact because that is an affect that they need. That is how they strengthen themselves is through that affect. When they're online, it is incumbent upon the teachers to make sure kids feel good about being there feel like they are part of something, feel like they are co contributing to whatever is happening in the virtual classroom. This, I think, is the hardest part of, of this virtual learning because I believe all learning is emotional. And without that emotional connection, it's hard for us to do this thing called learning. And affect is what is getting caught in the virtual, the virtual place but that makes it incumbent upon us as the other adults in the child's life to provide those opportunities to grow their affect, their positive affect. The uh, next side is the behavioral side, and the behavior side is all the social stuff. So in SEL, this is the S, because all behavior is social. Um, so it's how, how we learn how to study, how we learn how to listen, collaborate, communicate, and so forth. Um, now in the virtual platform, it's setting up plans of how to do things, setting up routines. So I'm sure that your teachers are going to be having certain time periods where they're going to be re requiring students to be face on or you know, virtual on for particular uh, lessons. Um, or engagement of to talk with the teacher. Um, I think the more you can set up routines in your home, the better off you're going to be. And stick to those routines. Limit their screen time. Limit the screen time. I really recommend that if a teacher is going to be, that they really have to take their six hour day and condense it down to about an hour. Um, I just was on a meeting today and we were told that if we do workshops for an hour, we condense those down to 15 minutes or actually graduate classes are condensed down to 15 minutes. So we, we know our attentions are not that good in this platform. However, if you set a routine with your child, to help them manage this behavioral side, which means that maybe if you've got a very, um, and one of them was about um, ADHD kids, uh, having kids set a timer and set it for 10 minutes and say at 10 minutes, put your, put your screen on pause and go you know, run around the house three times and come back in and get back to work. They need that minute mini brain break to get them back on track. What happens is if we keep going and going and going and going on stuff and people start sliding down in the chair. Now we've been going for 18 minutes and I can tell some of you, I, even though I can't see you, I know some of you are going like, well, what's happening outside? He's not really saying anything that matters to me right now. And, it's natural. It's natural in this. So we have to understand our kids are even more taken over by this. So set routines, try to stick with those routines, practice them with your child before school starts, practice those routines with them. And then how do they ask questions? How find out from the teacher what are going to be the avenues that kids can ask questions, that kids can 
talk with the teacher, that they can communicate with each other. You know, what are the different platforms that they're all using? Get yourself familiar with that because you're going to have to help them. Um, someone is going to need to help them because they don't know how to do it now. But again, the more you practice them, the better off you're going to be when it comes time for the virtual learning. The third side of the uh, um, self-regulation dimensions is what is called the cognition side. Now, here's where you're going to see the difference between gifted kids and the general population. Gifted kids have affect, gifted kids have behaviors. Gifted kids do have some differences cognitively. Some of it is neurological, but it's also the cognition, the thinking that is happening. There are three levels to cognition. The first level of cognition, the lowest level of cognition that everyone possesses, which is called metacognition. And metacognition, in teacher school, we called it thinking about our own thinking. That's not necessarily, that's too abstract of an idea for kids. So really metacognition is that which is our what we believe about ourselves, the, the, the voices that are going off in our heads, and hopefully they're good voices. Um, and this is where you can practice with your kid about having that, that good, um, good talk with yourself, to practice keeping your beliefs positive, to keep yourself positive with with uh, knowing that you can do this, that yes, it's hard, I acknowledge it's hard, but how do we keep thinking positively? So keeping the positive thoughts going. Metacognition is also um, that uh, reflective process that we go through. And reflection is an essential part of the learning process because we learn more from the reflection on the experience than we do from the experience itself. So after a meeting with the parent or with the teachers, you may want to do a two minute reflection. What worked for you? What didn't work for you? How did that make you feel? Um, what, what are kind of some of the anxieties that you're finding from this? What can we do together to do this? So helping them through the positive talk um, is going to be really important to help them balance that, that metacognition. The level up from that is called infracognition, and that is like an infrastructure. So it's like the structures of thinking. Um, we are all born creative, critical, problem solvers. You know, we're all born that way. But what's required now in this very complex world is a higher level of infracognition, of creativity, of critical reasoning, problem solving, and decision making. It's much higher than that. This is what we teach in school, those higher level structures to thinking. So that is what is called infracognition. Now, where it gets differentiated for gifted learners is in the metaphysical cognitive level. And metaphysical cognition is that which is that thinking beyond the self. So theoretical, philosophical uh, types of thinking, that is that esoteric, uh, broader, bigger thinking beyond the self. Now here is where, I, at, when I was studying self-regulation, and I've got a doctorate in gifted education, so I, you know, I kind of know a lot about it, um, but I never really could really get a hold of asynchrony. We've all heard that term before about many gifted kids can be very asynchronous, and, and it was like, well, I don't get it. I finally got it. Here's what it is. Many very gifted kids, especially highly gifted kids, hit metaphysical cognition extremely early. You know, most adults do, or most people don't hit it until later because of the prefrontal cortex and how it's developing and so forth. We don't hit that till maybe high school or maybe even college. Um, metaphysical cognition, they're hitting it extremely early. So um, I used to have first graders because I taught in school for gifted kids. Um, I used to have first graders that would come up to me and ask me these very esoteric kind of questions, like what happens when we die? And I knew it wasn't about decomposition and, you know, people die of diseases and all that stuff. But this little guy wanted to know what's beyond this. In fact, he did say kind of like he was Peggy Lee, there's got to be more than this. And so he was really projecting out into the spiritual world, you know, as to what's beyond this. And so that metaphysical cognition is that very 
broad kind of thinking. Well, here's the deal. He's still six, effectively, emotionally regulated. He's still six. So there's an imbalance there. So that is where the asynchrony happens. They're able to think so that Greta uh, Thunberg, I think her last name is, the little girl in, in uh, Sweden who is uh, all about climate change and, and uh, uh, she was criticized for crying um, when she was speaking to the UN. Well, that's the asynchrony. That's her asynchronous development. Not that she's on the spectrum, ASD. No, 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 no. It's because she, she's so, she knows this is a big issue, but she can't manage it emotionally because she's still 12 or 13, I don't know how old she is now, but she's still 12 or 13 years old. And so that is what is called asynchrony. This is what I've learned, is that these three must work together. They have to work together. They must be in tandem with each other. So we've gotta have our cognition aligned with our affect and our affect aligned with our behaviors because you take one of them off and it takes the other two with it. So when I'm feeling anxious, I'm going to behave in a way that maybe isolates myself or rages against other people. And I'm going to think badly about myself because why am I the anxious one in all of this? Why isn't everyone else just as anxious as me? So this is where parents come in and say, I get, you, I, I get it. I'm anxious too. Here's what I do when I get anxious. I go for a walk. I take deep breaths, I meditate, I listen to music, I try to calm myself down, and I try to do that self-talk that says, this will be okay. We will be okay. It's tough right now, but it's going to be okay. So trying to teach your kids how to use the ABCs of learning, get it? Affect, behavior, cognition, yeah. So it's the ABCs. Always keeping those three balanced is gonna be extremely important. And I know I'm probably running really long here, so I'm going to jump to the next slide here. Um, and <laughs> okay, um, what we do know is that self-regulation develops in stages. It yes can be chronological in stages, but it also happens all the time. So no matter what age you are, you're always going through these four stages of developing your self-regulation. Hopefully, you get better each time you go through it. So the first stage is what is called the modeling and observing stage. Like I said, you've got to model this for your kids. You've got to model how you manage your stress, how you manage your anxiety, how you manage dealing with problems, how you manage doing your job in isolation. What are the things that you're doing that you are, that you are having to deal with ABC, right? You've got to model that for your kids. You've got to be very overt about it. They may not ask, but you got to tell them. And sometimes they're going to roll their eyes at you um, and they're going to say, I get it, I get it. But you've got to do that. It's very important because ultimately what happens then is they copy and do it. They start doing it that way. They start practicing or they start copying exactly what you do. That usually is a fairly short term because you move into what's then called practice and refinement. Now I'm going to make it mine. So now I'm going to hone it down to who I am and the way I like to deal with things. Ultimately, you get to that independence and application, so you're no longer, no longer having to hold their hands, so to speak, as they try to deal with their ABCs of learning and ABCs of managing this, this virtual world. Now, if there are teachers on uh, this, this meeting here, um, you'll see that there's a subtitle to each one of these. The I do, you watch, I do, you help, I do, I, you do, I help, you do, I watch. Well, you might recognize that as what has been called the GRR, or Gradual Release of Responsibility format. Well, um, it really should be the gradual release of control, not responsibility, because really what you're trying to do is teachers stepping back from the students and letting students take on the responsibility and, and the teacher releasing control for them. So actually the GRR did come out of studies on self-regulation. So that's where this is all tying in together here. So in the handout, which I understand is gonna be put up on the uh, CAG team website tomorrow, you'll have these additional slides here that I'm gonna jump past pretty quickly 
there, there are a lot of words there. So this just tells you effectively, behavior, and cognitively, kind of what should you be doing in the model, observe, copy, and do, practice, refine, and independent and application stages um, for your students, your children. Um, speaking of virtual learning, um, learning has a cycle to it. So it goes in for phases now. Now we have the fostering confidence phase, we have the setting and managing goal phase, then we have the monitor and adjust phase, and the review and reflection phase, and it starts all over again. So here is what um, I would re recommend to parents and recommend to teachers. As you're going to start any new um, unit of study or any new skill development or anything like that, first and foremost, you have to make sure that your kids are feeling good about where they're at. They have to feel confident. They have to feel confident that they can manipulate the Zoom or Seesaw or whatever you're on. They have to be able to manage the, the camera and the sound and all those things. But they also need to feel confident that they can learn in this setting. It's not just learn the techniques of what the teacher is trying to teach, but they need to feel confident that they can learn this way. So you may want to um, use the analogy or use the idea of when you watch a video game, do you learn from that, that game? When you watch TV, do you learn from the TV? Well, that's basically the same thing where it's in that same format. So it's really, really super essential that kids feel confident moving into this platform. So build up their self-esteem, build up their sense of what is called efficacy, that they feel like they've got the tools to be able to do what they need to do. The next uh, phase of the learning is then kids have to decide what are they going to get out of this? It's they set the goal, not the teacher. The kids have to set the goal. So in this case, what it might be is that kids say, I'm gonna set a timer and I'm gonna try and pay attention as hard as I can for seven minutes. After that seven minutes, I stop, I start it over again, okay? So I set a goal. It doesn't have to be a goal about the learning. It has to be a goal about how to manage this virtual setting here. Um, what am I gonna do when I have a question? How do I raise my hand? All that stuff. So it's setting that goal and say, what am I gonna get out of this setting? And then during that setting, they have to then monitor it and say, how am I doing? How am I doing? When I do start to go off task, I have to look at my clock and say, oh, I went off task on three minutes. I, you know what? Next time I set a goal, I'm going to set it for five minutes, not seven minutes, because it is okay to adjust your goal down rather than not hit it at all, because that makes you feel bad if you didn't hit it. And now I do want to mention to you that goals should be very, very short-term goals, not long-term goals. Um, I always say, how many of us set a New Year's resolution, which is a goal, and we're still holding to it on January 15th? Not a lot of us. So that means that you failed. That's that mental process of I failed. What I got to do is I've got to say, okay, you know what? Wait a minute, because I did have a goal of, 20 pounds in 2020. I was talking about getting rid of 20 pounds in 2020. I think I'm adjusting that to gaining 20 pounds in 2020. But no, it's to understand that, okay, maybe my plan got scrapped because of what's happening now, but I still need to say, okay, I do need to maybe drop five pounds or 10 pounds because of everything that's going on now. So it's, we must help kids manage and adjust our goals that we set for ourselves. Again, the final uh, phase, which is the reflection phase, is super, super important. Teachers, if you're out there, make sure there's a way that kids can reflect on their learning, whether it be on, on uh, the whiteboard system or any of your uh, chat systems that you have. Parents, take a moment, sit down with your kids um, at the end of the day and say, tell me three things that were difficult for you today. Tell me two things that you liked about what happened today. And tell me one thing that you'd like to be able to do better tomorrow. I always use a three, two, one. Three things, and I just say three things that 
I just said three things that are difficult or three things that you're happy about and two things that you'd like to change about tomorrow and one question that you have for the teacher tomorrow. So always go through that process because that sets up then that ability to feel confident going in to that beginning phase again because it starts all over again throughout that whole learning process. So every day that your kid is going on, they're going through these four phases and we should stick to them with our kids and help them manage that. So uh, another one of the slides that I'm gonna pass quickly is where I then took the four stages of self-regulation and cross matrixed it to the four phases of the learning process. And you can see there are different ideas and different examples in there for you. So I'm gonna stop yakking at this point and take, let me um, take uh, Liz, Elizabeth, let me take any of these questions that I didn't get to. Oh, and by the way, yes, I'm a shameless self-promoter, shameless. <laughs> this is how I make my money. Um, if any, any of you as, uh, teachers that are out there or parents that are out there that would like to buy a book for a teacher. Um, I have three of them. The Advancing Differentiation book was my first book. And uh, then uh, I wrote with my good friend, Diane Hecox, the book on differentiating for gifted learners. And then my third book being the self-regulation book. Um, you can receive 25% off plus free shipping if you go to www.freespirit.com. You cannot do this with Amazon. This is the only place you can do that. And you put in that code there, DIFFGIFT, um, to do that. Uh, this might be for parents out there. This might be a wonderful gift that you give to uh, your child's teacher. Just thank you for all the hard work that you're doing to make this as pleasurable as possible. Uh, it might also be that holiday gift that you want to get for a teacher, or it also might be something that you want to donate to your school as a resource uh, for your children, especially for the gifted, uh, giving them that book on differentiating for gifted kids. So, Elizabeth. I I think you should totally self-promote and I didn't say at the beginning and I should have said you are one of our keynote speakers at our conference in October and you're doing a couple of signature series for us so for all of you out there who want more uh, from Richard uh, please more. sign up to come to our conference uh, <laughs> because you'll get a lot of sessions from him there um, one of the questions that a member sent in ahead of time um, because I think you talked about the affect, but what about those kids? And the question was specific to intermediate elementary students. They say they're doing fine. They say mm -hmm. I'm okay. And you know yeah. that they're just not and their anxiety is high. How right. do you dig a little deeper in a virtual platform? Well, he here's, here's my recommendation. First and foremost, ask open-ended question. Don't ask um, nothing, you know, questions that get a one word answer. Um, so really try to do open, open-ended questions such as, tell me something that's frustrating you about this learning. And in some cases, and they, they may say nothing, which is not true, because everybody has something that frustrates them about something. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to model it first for them, saying, you know, I really am struggling with working in the virtual platform. You have to open the door for them. Um, because I think kids want to save their parents from knowing that they're anxious or not feeling good. And some kids like to hold their affect close to their chest. You know, they're, they're like holding their cards close um, because they don't know how to respond to it. They don't know how to talk about it. They don't have the vocabulary. They don't have the, the experiences where it's happened before right? So they need you as the adults in the room to open the door for them and say, you know what? I'm feeling really anxious today. And I'll tell you why I'm feeling anxious because I've not, well, here, I was telling Liz before we went on, I said, today I've had four uh, Zoom meetings in four different time zones. And I'm running from one place of my house to the other place of my house because of you know the evening one i can't be downstairs and so forth and so um, i'm frustrated i'm i'm anxious so um i've got my little glass of wine sitting here and later i'm going to be going out to dinner kind of get take a breather 
guess I'm not going to tell my kids that I'm drinking um, to solve my problems, but I'm going to say, here's what I do. I go for a walk. I take a deep breath. So I think the more you can use more open-ended kind of questions and also model it for your kids and, and hopefully eventually they'll start opening up. Um, it's not going to be something that's going to be instantaneous. The other thing is you may want to encourage if you've got a writer, a child who loves to write and loves to journal, that's some ways in some kids, they, that's how they get rid of it. That's how they get rid of their anxiety is they write about it. And they, you know, either can create a character who deals with it or uh, they write about themselves and how they're going to deal with it. Um, and sometimes they want to share those things and sometimes they don't because I think that that emotional reaction, the emotional responses are very personal. They're very personal things to do. So I would say really, you know, modeling and open-ended questions are probably the, the best to do at this point. I love how you said as parents, we're the first model that our kids are going to see how to respond to any of this. And we struggle right. as well and being open about our own process and even our feelings about whether we're glad that school is virtual to begin with or we're frustrated by that. Our kids mm -hmm. are going to mimic how we respond to these things and to be right. careful about what we're modeling for them. Yeah, it, and you know, that kind of brings up then that, that question that was posed to how do we respond to students and their parents when they say this is fake news and it's all a hoax. Um, it, it, here, here's what I have to say. Number one, when those things happen, because this has been like the worst four plus years of my life, and I'm old, um, it's because we've gotten so, we cannot listen to each other. We don't listen to each other. We are not respectful of listening to other people. So the first thing I say to myself, because I have many relatives that live in North Carolina, and um, I have to pause, especially through Facebook and social media. Um, usually what I do is I, I ask the question of myself, is this worth the energy? Is it worth the energy to struggle with this? Because all I'm going to do, all I have to remember, first and foremost, our belief systems are a religion. They are a religion. I am not going to change someone's belief system by arguing with them. So what I'm going to say is if I do want to engage in it in some way, shape, or form, you know, besides just nodding my head and smiling and walking away um, and saying everything else in my head about them. But um, what if I do have to say anything, I'm going to ask, what's the source? What is your source? Tell me your source. If it's Facebook, it's not credible. You know, and, and we could even say that the major uh, Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, Breitbart, wh whoever you choose to, to listen to, look for other sources. Don't look just at that one source because you know that there's, there's the reality and our truths and there's a gap in between there. So really we have to model that for our kids and help them understand that, yes, even we are struggling with this as adults because you bet, do I want bars to open back up in Minneapolis? Absolutely, because I, I miss the energy that gets created in there. But I have to stop and say to myself, what's the greater good? What is best for the greater good? It's not about me now, it's about the greater good. And so I think we have to model those, our anxieties about that, how we struggle with that, and just and bring that to our student, our children, um, and, and again, teach them how to deal with people that are never going to believe what you believe. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. Um, I love that response um, because everything's so political now. And so it's hard to think about how to address that with young children. And um, mm -hmm. our nation is very divided <laughs> on most things. So I think that that's a great response. Um, one other question we got from a member, and I'm assuming this would be if uh, we're having in-person learning and maybe there are some schools or districts that are still planning on going in person in some format. Um, how do we reassure children of their safety and make them feel comfortable? Or when we do return to in-person learning later in the year, how do we 
help kids with that anxiety around am I safe mm -hmm. um, and, and feeling like they can yep. engage in the learning environment. You know, and that kind of goes back, back to that idea of metaphysical cognition. These kids are thinking beyond and they're, you know, they understand the, the um, especially our gifted kids really understand the, the nuances of this, this the, the issues of safety, of health safety. Um, I think, again, it's modeling. We have to model that for our kids and we have to reassure them that the adults around them are trying their very hardest to do what we have been told is the right thing to do for our students. As well as making our kids as responsible for their own health and safety as the adults are doing because they too are gonna have to keep their masks on if you're face on. They too are gonna have to socially distance. They too are gonna have to wash their hands over and over and over again. Those are the three things that we know that we must do. Whether you believe this is a hoax or not, it is like wearing a seatbelt in your car. There were a lot of people in the beginning of the seatbelt craze that were vehemently against it. Well, we found out later that it does save lives right so we've got to do those things we've got to do those three things if you know if, wear your mask not for yourself but for other people because you're projecting right wash your hands as much as you can or use the hand sanitizers as much as san sanitizers as much as you can and keep your distance. I know you want to run up and hug your friends, but I'm doing virtual hugs now. I'm standing back and I'm doing the, or what we call air kisses. Well, you know, so we're, you ha we have to do that. This is like changing the whole culture in a matter of minutes, literally minutes. So we, we've got to let our kids know that the adults around them are doing their best and that they too have a responsibility to this. They are not to share, they are not to trade masks, like trading cards. They're not to pull it down unless they're eating. They are to wash their hands as often as possible. And I'm sure schools are gonna have hand sanitizer on every desk. Um, they too need to be responsible. So, and- I was, and, just, I was and, just thinking as you were talking, it's kind of like when fidgets became popular that mm -hmm. you know it's a tool and kids have to buy into that you are part of the success of this otherwise everything falls Absolutely. apart right 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 Similar idea. And, and i and I, the, the that question was you know safety and still be telling them the truth um again the the truth may be hard may be hard to understand because one of the things that that i found vastly interesting about the virus was how small the virus is in comparison to um you know a, a cell in your body and um i think it i i'm not exactly sure but i remember it as saying is think of a soccer ball as as the virus and think of a 50 story building as a cell. That's how minute this virus is. And then I would suggest with your bright kids, teach them, help them understand what a virus does. A virus, it, it's just a parasite. It just gets it there and it takes over and it creates itself. So it really is considered the smartest organism on the planet because it's learned how to modify itself so quickly. So let them know that the realities, and some of it's super, super fascinating about viruses. And you know, we, we've got a long history of virus and now we know these things. So I would say teach them the realities of it, but also let them know that they will be safe. The adults are doing the best they can and they have a responsibility in the process. I love that. Um, our last question is from Facebook, and uh, I think it's from Hilda. She said, I'm shameless. Could I have a signed book if I yeah. purchase one? <laughs> and uh, well, I think um, our executive director posted that we are doing a virtual book signing 
at our conference. So if you oh. sign up and come to our virtual conference, there's a way to get a signed book that way. I don't know if there's another way to get a signed book from you. <laughs> yeah, um, not not for me because they all come from my publisher. Um, but Elizabeth, we can talk about that. That um, that there is a way that I can because I live in the like ten, five miles from my publisher. And so what I often have done has gone and just signed books and then sell them to sell you all the signed books and then you can sell those books. So okay. we can, we can work we'll have it a out. conversation, but uh, you know, come to the virtual book signing at our conference in October yes. is one way to guarantee that, right? <laughs> yes. 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 I just want to thank you so much. Uh, for sharing. Oh, I think that this topic is so needed right now. There is a lot of anxiety, kids, adults, everyone, teachers, just nervous about what this is going to look like and how do we do this uh, successfully. Um, so mm -hmm. I think that this was the perfect topic for tonight. Again, uh, Dr. Richard Cash is a keynote at our conference in October and doing uh, some of our uh, other sessions for us too. Um, before we go tonight, I just want to let you know that next week we have uh, Dr. Michelle Dubois and Dr. Robin Green. They are presenting uh, Latinx Gifted Learners, a Culturally Responsive Approach for Identification and Programming. Um, so that'll be one that you don't want to miss as well. Um, so share this with your friends, have them come back and watch it. Uh, we're just excited to share this information in a time when it's, it's needed. <laughs> so. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you all of the people who attended. It was it was a joy. I wish I could have seen your faces. And by the way, I am much taller in person. <laughs> so there. I know we haven't met in person and I won't get to meet no. you at conference, but sometime soon. Yeah. So sometime thank you guys. Soon. Yes. All right. <laughs> we'll see you thank next you. week. <laughs>